Hydrocephalus can be defined broadly as a disturbance of formation, flow, or absorption of the cerebrospinal fluid, which leads to increase in volume occupied by this fluid inside the central nervous system. Before we begin our discussion on hydrocephalus itself, we may recall our knowledge on the anatomy of the ventricular system and the flow of CSF. Now, cerebrospinal fluid is mainly produced by the choroid plexus of the lateral and fourth ventricle. Normal CSF production is about 0.2 to 0.35 milliliters per minute. Normal circulating volume of CSF is 120 milliliters. This is a crude diagram of the ventricular system of the brain. CSF, produced in the lateral ventricle, drain into the third ventricle through the interventricular foramen. Third ventricle and the fourth ventricle are connected via the cerebral aqueduct, which is located in the midbrain. CSF in the third ventricle drain into the fourth ventricle and then into the subarachnoid space through the foramen of Lushka and foramen of Magendi. The most inferior part of the fourth ventricle continues downwards as the central canal of the spinal cord, which is also filled with CSF. From the subarachnoid space, CSF is absorbed into the venous blood and the dural venous sinuses via arachnoid granulations. When the CSF production is greater than its absorption, it causes accumulation of CSF inside the ventricles and the subarachnoid space, which ultimately increases the intracranial pressure. This imbalance between the production and absorption can occur due to overproduction of CSF, increased resistance to the CSF flow, reduced CSF absorption, and increased pressure in the dural sinuses, which indirectly reduces the CSF absorption. When CSF accumulates in the subarachnoid space, excess fluid is absorbed by the optic nerve roots, which causes enlargement of the optic nerve. This condition is known as papilledema. Due to the increased CSF volume, ventricles get dilated. Dilation of lateral ventricles causes elevation of corpus callosum, stretching and perforation of the septum pellucidum, and thinning of the cerebral cortex. This MRI section demonstrates the dilation of lateral and fourth ventricles due to the increased volume of CSF. And you can clearly see the elevation of corpus callosum due to the increased CSF volume. Enlargement of third ventricle down to the pituitary fossa may cause pituitary dysfunction. Enlargement of third ventricle can also cause compression of the midbrain as well. In addition, due to the raised intracranial pressure, some parts of the brain can get herniated. This image shows the herniation of cerebellar tonsil through the foramen magnum. Signs and symptoms of hydrocephalus are influenced by the patient's age, cause of hydrocephalus, location of the obstruction, and its duration. Symptoms in infants include head enlargement, poor feeding, irritability, reduced activity, and vomiting. In children and adults, slowing of mental capacity, headache, neck pain, suggesting tonsillar herniation vomiting, blurred vision due to papilledema, double vision due to sixth nerve palsy, drowsiness, limb spasticity and difficulty in walking due to the stretching of pyramidal and periventricular tracts. There are four types of hydrocephalus. They are normal pressure hydrocephalus, communicating hydrocephalus, non-communicating hydrocephalus, and congenital hydrocephalus. First, let's discuss about NPH. It is a rare condition which occurs in elderly people. Ventricles get enlarged, but they have a normal intracranial pressure. No papilledema. Sometimes, intracranial pressure increases at night. There is a classic triad of symptoms in NPH. They are gataproxia, where there is a difficulty in initiating the walking movements, dementia, and incontinence. Initially urinary incontinence followed by fecal incontinence. Headache is not a typical symptom of NPH. The mechanism of NPH is poorly understood. However, some theories suggest that there is a resistance to the CSF flow within the ventricles, which leads to increased intracranial pressure at night. This causes stretching of the ventricular walls and ultimately, enlargement of the ventricles. In communicating hydrocephalus, there is a normal flow of CSF between the ventricles and subarachnoid space. This condition occurs due to defective absorption of CSF into the venous blood and rarely it can occur due to overproduction of the cerebrospinal fluid. Causes of communicating hydrocephalus include intracranial hemorrhage, meningitis, and brain tumors which cause damage to the arachnoid granulations, and venous thrombosis, which causes venous drainage insufficiency and impairment of the CSF absorption. 
Accumulation of CSF within the subarachnoid space leads to atrophy of surrounding brain tissue and deep white matter structures. And crowding of sulci. This image shows the atrophy of brain tissue. And you can see the crowding of sulci due to the increased pressure within the subarachnoid space. Non-communicating hydrocephalus occurs when there is an obstruction to the flow of CSF within the ventricles or its outlets, like foramen of Lushka and Magendi. The major cause of non-communicating hydrocephalus is mass-occupying lesions within the brain, which disrupt the ventricular anatomy. This leads to accumulation of CSF and enlargement of ventricles. These images demonstrate the enlargement of ventricles in non-communicating hydrocephalus. Congenital hydrocephalus is referred to as dilation of ventricles during fetal or infancy period. Causes include obstruction of cerebral aqueduct, chiari malformation, in which a part of the brain extends into the spinal canal due to an abnormality of the skull, premature births, which cause bleeding into the brain and disrupt the CSF flow, dandy walker malformation, which is a rare condition which is characterized by the agenesis of cerebellum and cystic dilation of the fourth ventricle, leading to disruption of the flow of CSF. Diagnosis of hydrocephalus is mainly based on clinical findings. In infants, enlargement of the head, disjunction of sutures, dilation of scalp veins, tense frontinelle, increased spasticity, especially in lower limbs, setting sun sign, which is characterized by retracted upper eyelids, downward deviation of ocular globes, and visible white sclerae above iris. In children and adults, blurred vision due to papilledema, failure of upward gaze unsteady gait, large head, and sixth nerve palsy, and normal pressure hydrocephalus, increased reflexes and positive Babinski sign, vascular Parkinsonism, which is characterized by slow movements, tremor and difficulty in walking. However, these patients have normal muscle strength with no sensory loss. Imaging studies include CT scanning to assess the size of the ventricles, MRI scanning for the presence of periaqueductal or cerebellar tumors and chiari malformation. Ultrasound scanning in infants for subependymal and intraventricular hemorrhages. Skull radiography for the erosion of cella tersica. There is no specific blood test to diagnose hydrocephalus. Surgical treatment is the preferred therapeutic option in hydrocephalus. Most patients eventually undergo shunt placements, such as the following. Ventriculoperitoneal shunt is used to drain excess CSF from the ventricles into the peritoneal cavity. Ventriculoatrial shunt is used to drain excess CSF from the ventricles into the right atrium. Lumboperitoneal shunt is used for communicating hydrocephalus. In this method, CSF in the lumbar subarachnoid space is drained into the peritoneal cavity. Torkildsen shunt is used rarely and only for acquired non-communicating hydrocephalus. In this method, CSF is drained from the lateral ventricles into the cisterna magna. Rapid onset hydrocephalus is a medical emergency and need to be corrected immediately. Treatments include ventricular tapping in infants, open ventricular drainage in children and adults, and VP or VA shunt. Other methods of treating hydrocephalus include choroid plexotomy or choroid plexus coagulation to reduce CSF formation, opening of stenist aqueducts and endoscopic fenestration of the third ventricle.